do this presentation. Thanks, Al. Thank you, Bethany. <laughs> well, welcome everybody. We've got a nice crowd today. And and um I, I don't know how the weather is there, but it's kind of a nice day here. So it's just uh I don't know. I'm, I'm really optimistic. <laughs> um so I have been uh farming or gardening for I don't know, 50, 45 years, whatever. I can't I can't even remember how old I am. <laughs> uh but um uh I, I um originally I had called this this class dumping the bag, basically meaning doing without a bag fertilizer and I, I which I have tried to do for um, many years now uh, <clears throat> and I, I teach a lot of gardening classes so I, I don't use a lot of uh, high-tech things I don't use a lot of purchase things because I like to teach people how to how to do without uh, needing a rototiller or things like that so you you will see a lot of um, uh, techniques I'm going to uh, describe that, that will be um, basically you know, using hand hand technology. So hopefully it's appropriate for everybody. Um, if you are a, uh, uh, a... Oh, good. All right. Thank God. All I think was <clears throat> if you're a beginning gardener, I think you get a lot out of this. If you're, if you're an experienced gardener, hopefully you will too. Or if you're a beginning farmer, I think uh, there's hopefully something to learn for, for everybody. Um, I'm going to just give a, uh, let's see, can I, am I share screen already? Yep, I am. Okay. And let's see, I want a full screen. Um, um, okay. I'm going to give just a quick overview. I'm going to go into uh, three or four different ways that you can increase your uh, uh, decrease your dependency on bag fertilizer. Um, and um, we're going to start out with just a, a basic, a, a couple of basics on composting or a couple of, uh, you know, basic ways of composting. And then I'll get into one of my chief fertility inputs, which is leaves and how I use them, how I apply them and, and what I do with them. Uh, and then we'll get into cover crops and then how to, you know, plant, manage, whatever. And then um, how to actually go about for, uh, transfer from a cover crop to getting the soil ready for planting. So um, yeah, again, as Bethany said, if you have questions, I uh, don't mind taking questions, uh, put them in the chat. There's a, uh, a, a couple of times I'll be asking for comments uh, and I would, I think we can do that in the chat too. I'm not sure I'll stop to read the comments, but if everybody can share them, that, that would be fine. So um <clears throat> What, are, what we are going to start out with is compost. The most simple way of composting is just a heap. And I've done this many years, just heap things. Um, uh, one of the issues here is the squirrels, uh, probably even the rodents, uh, can get into it and scatter it around. Uh, and it just kind of, you, you kind of lose a lot. So I really um, suggest uh, containing it in some way so we can grow nice, healthy crops like this. Um, <clears throat> Of the ones that are that are uh, available for purchase, this is probably my favorite. I've never owned a purchased composter, but I have plenty of friends that do, and they often ask me for my help. Uh, and this one, as well as some of the others you'll see, I, I don't think any of them are perfect. But the, the issue with this type of a composter is that things can kind of get matted down. You don't get much air in there, and then uh, things become a, like a, a wet. Uh, stinky clog. So I think this one works better than some of the others, but you do need to get in there with a digging fork, you know, maybe once every other month or something like that, just kind of fluff things off. The top comes off and quite a few of these composters that I'm going to show you, they may be available in your, your local hardware stores or I'm sorry, garden supply stores, um, but they're all uh, many varieties are available from Gardener Supply, which is located in Burlington, Vermont. You can Google them. Uh, they have an online catalog. So uh, uh, just another type. It's a little bigger type. Um, again, I've never used it myself, but uh, you may have to get in there with a digging fork just to fluff things up once in a while. Uh, one of the the uh, one of the nice things about this model is that you put things in the top and there's a tray at the bottom. You can pull things out from the bottom. Um, this one doesn't have that as far as I know, so you, you kind of need to set it up, and let it cook, and then take things out after a while, but um, certainly, um, 
you know, a homemade model. Basically, this is uh, this one happens to be big enough for both, you know, yard trash, leaves, whatever. But your kitchen scraps can go into your too. Um, the idea is you've got one side cooking and the other side is um, uh, what you're adding to. Uh, there are several of these turners. Uh, this is a big one. I'm not sure if it's even still available. I, I, as far as I know, it is. But um, uh, the the complaint that the owner of this has is it's too hard to crank. Uh, yeah, she, she said it, it actually works pretty well, but it's, it's just really hard to crank. This, um, uh, if you're in a limited space, um, I think this, this basically this is a worm farm. Uh, they come in layers. You put the compost or the garbage or whatever on the top. You need a lot of some carbon there to absorb the moisture, so shredded leaves are what's suggested. And these are available online. I think I've, I've tried Googling them. I think Worm Farm or something like that. And um, uh, at the bottom, basically you add from the top and you have to inoculate it with worms to start with. But once you inoculate it with, with worms, um, they'll spread from one layer to the other. They just, um, you know, they, they find their way. And uh, there's liquid that will come out the bottom. This can be used as a... Um, what do you call it? A uh, liquid fertilizer. Um, it, it's quite a good one. Um, this is basically what it looks like, pretty much what it looks like at the finish. So basically you, you add from the top and you take away the bottom, one of these trays and, you know, you use it, put it back on the top and that's what you add to. And the, and the worms will find their way from layer to layer. Uh, okay. This is my own compost pile. Um, after, after experimenting with a, a few different ways, I just decided on a three bin. Uh, system. Those newspapers are not laid down every year. I just put those down when I when I built this, and this was a shot when it, it was new. Um, if you notice, I don't think I would use treated posts. Most of the posts we can get are treated. I happen to use cedar. Uh, it was my own cedar. I cut it myself. But if you notice, the posts do not go into the ground. Cedar posts will rot at the place they are where the ground meets the air. Um, but if you put them on top of the ground, especially if you put on some stones, they'll last for, you know, forever. This is, uh, what's going on 17 years old right now. There's no sign of rotting on the, on the bottom of those posts. This is when it was new. Um, but basically on the right-hand side is where I put my new compost. Uh, when it fills up, I, I actually, uh, push it over to the middle, which is where most of the actual composting happens. And then when it's finished, I just put it over on the, on the left-hand side, and that's what I use from now. Um, I don't know if you can see my arrow, but you can see a, uh, a golden metal um, ring right there. It's actually a, uh, a tractor pin. Uh, and that's what it looks like on one end. And then it's, it's got its uh, pin on the other end. Let me go back a couple. Um, this board in here, separating those two, um, I can take out because of these tractor pins. And so I don't have to shovel things over a, um, you know, a big fence when I move from, from uh, uh, side to side, uh, from to the right, right to the middle. Um, and the, the shoveling is actually done with a fork and it's actually good because it kind of aerates the pile. Uh, so it makes it a lot easier if you have that, that, uh, middle, middle board, they're movable. Okay. Um, it doesn't hurt if you have an open compost pile like this, it's not enclosed. If you, if you, uh, chop things up with a knife, when I bring things like vines, pea, this happens to be pea vines I'm chopping, but sometimes I'll bring cover crop over here and chop it up into pieces. It doesn't have to be done, but it does make things, uh, mat down a little bit more. So it doesn't take up quite as much space. And it will um, speed up the composting process. Now, this is what I call a Johnson, Johnson Sioux uh, digester. Um, the idea here is this is long-term compost that I want to leave in here for a couple of years. And I'm trying to grow mycelium. Uh, mycelium uh, as opposed to bacterial um, rich compost. And then take this mycelium rich compost and mix it in with my own compost when I when I apply it. So trying to encourage mycelium. Um, it's uh, my, mycelium, basically it's fungal mycelium. Uh, it's a more stable form of carbon in the soil. 
and uh, the mycelium can reach out a lot farther than than plant roots to to um, you know get and exchange nutrients. Now, um, teaching you how to make one of these would be a whole nother workshop. However, um, there's a very good explanation. This is how I how, how I built mine. Actually, the, the 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 directions were for farm size, and I just cut everything down. In the fall issue of the Natural Farmer, the, the TNF, which I, I know all members get. Um, uh, Heather or Bethany, could you put that in the chat, please? The fall issue of the uh, the Natural Farmer. Uh, the back issues of the Natural Farmer are generally on the Natural Farmer website, but the website is being redone. And so right now they're not available. But if you check back there, um, uh, you know, probably in a, in a month or two, I think the the older issues will be back up and, and available. Um, now, Johnson, uh, Johnson and Sue, it's a husband and wife team. Uh, they live in Arizona and they recommend watering this daily. Uh, but, you know, we have a little more moisture, humidity in our climate, and I'm not that enthusiastic. I don't water mine, uh, maybe water once a week or something like that. I don't know how my mycelium growth compares to them who, you know, do water it every day, but um you know, I'm, I'm going to continue to, to use this. Now, um, what what that is filled with is um, municipal uh, composted leaves, which is the only thing I can get in that, you know, in that amount uh, to, um, to to start this going. So I want to, there, there's a lot of other things around our kitchens that we, we can use. This is actually a five gallon, uh, what do you call it, five gallon pail of, ground limestone and in it i have buried bones like probably beef bones lamb bones something i'm not sure but it could be any type of bone and i would say this bone has been in there for about a year maybe maybe two i can't remember quite quite well that well but um and what happens is it's just some kind of a chemical reaction i'm not sure what it is but there's no been no water added to the lime it's just a natural process that it breaks down that bone it, it, it can crumble and um so basically, if your soil needs calcium, particularly if it needs phosphorus, uh, bones are higher in phosphorus than regular uh, limestone. So uh, this is a way you, you can get it um, and um, you know, make some good use of it. Um, also, um, do some composting in a, uh, basically, in, it's in a, I don't know, what do you call it, a um, storage container. Um, so what I did was I took a um, just a regular storage container that you would use in a basement or whatever, uh, cut the bottom out, put some hardware cloth there, uh, drilled holes inside and the top, and um, oh yeah, sorry, uh, and then put bones in, chicken bones, whatever, and then fill the, the rest of it up with compost. It takes a long time, and I, I don't think I can I can quite have gotten the the uh, you know how often the Questions like how often do you add moisture? Um, but uh, it, it's basically mimicking what happens on a in a uh, large poultry farm where they they have emptied the house out. They have a windrow of, of compost. And when they get a, a chicken that has died, uh, they just basically throw it in the middle of that compost. And within a week, uh, at least within two weeks, there's no sign of that chicken left. So uh, Probably even better than than finished compost in here would be something like chicken manure with uh, you know a fairly high nitrogen ratio, but um, it, it will break those bones down. Um, okay, we often um, you know have shellfish, whether it be lobster or or clams. I'm not saying we have them that often, but um, so I, I hate to throw things out, and um, so I had had some uh, cement being delivered for something else. And I built a little box about a, about a foot square, not quite a foot square, but, uh, and then I sunk these, um, uh, I don't know what we call them, uh, eye, eye bolts, I guess, in there and put a rope between them. And basically I'm taking my shells and I'm dropping that on them and creating small pieces. Now, uh, I do this a few times, I can get some of it will be powder, some of it will still be larger pieces, but this is small enough that I can actually, uh, you know, throw it in the garden and, and, and it'll be, um, it'll uh, basically takes a while for these to break down, but they will actually break down after all. You can't, you can't find them anymore. Now, I do use bag compost once in a while. Uh, and 
I do it in a situation where I really don't want any weeds. I don't compost at a high heat, so I, I cannot uh, vouch that my compost is without weeds. Uh, so where I will use it is in my strawberries because I so can't I can't afford to you to um, you know get weeds in my strawberries. It's just too hard too too hard to control. Yeah. So for my fertility for strawberries and you know if you have another crop that you really uh, are are conscious about not getting weeds in there, um, then I think the bag compost is appropriate because it, it comes basically without weeds. It's been compost at a high enough temperature, as has um, things that you, you can get either from a local farm in, in our area, you know, your, your area might have plenty of dairy farms. Our area is not that far away from Kennett Square, where most of the mushrooms in this country are grown. And so we can get fairly cheap um, uh, loads of um, mushroom compost, uh, you know, another good source of, of nutrients. So um, generally, uh, the, the mushroom compost is only about, I think it's like four or six dollars a ton last time I checked. The, the trucking is what's expensive. So if you have a pickup truck and you have a mushroom farm near you, you can quite often go and sometimes if you shovel it, you can get it for nothing. They load you, it's um, it, it, there's an expense to it. And I don't have any particularly um, uh, ingenious ways of applying the compost once it's there. Um, uh, basically, most 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 compost I just apply with a shovel. I uh, basically I'd use a little bit of a twisting action, fill up a shovel, a little twisting action, and it, and it seems to scatter it fairly well. Or you know, if you have a, a hole, you're putting a, a a plant in, a pepper plant, or something like that. I I, I often put some right in the hole too. Okay, so <clears throat> another source is leaves, and we all probably all have some kind of source of leaves, whether it be from the municip municipality or from our own homes. Um, uh, whoops, sorry. So I garden in raised beds, in the permanent raised beds. So my rows are permanent rows. So every fall, I will go around the neighborhood, and I'll collect leaves, and I will fill the rows up between my beds with about a, now well, it could be up to a foot thick of leaves. Now, when you walk on it a few times, it goes down to about, you know, three or four inches, but um, it does two things. One is it's it's composting all winter long. And so it it's giving my overall garden some nu nutrition. But the other thing is, is that I walk in here, you know, a, a lot in the winter time, particularly um, some, some of my beds I have filled with kale uh, all winter long. Uh, and it allows me to walk in without like walking in mud. You know, everything's wet all winter long. So this really uh, allows me to, uh, a real dry area to, to walk in. Now, springtime, uh, the leaves are still, they still look like they did in the, in the spring, I mean, sorry, in the fall, uh, except they've been matted down a lot because I would have walked over them. Uh, but, and, I, and I'll show you, I, I do a special application with my raspberries. My raspberries are, I should say were, I had to take them out because of a disease, but um, they were fall raspberries. So they grow up from the ground every year. Basically, this is what it looks like in probably June. Uh, but this is what it looks like in, in November or December. Everything's died. Uh, those are this year's canes. And I just basically cover the whole raspberry patch with about a foot of leaves. And that's the only fertility I've ever given to my raspberry patch. Now, the significance of the significance of this, we'll see to the towards the end of this talk. I am going to show you uh, so soil samples from various parts of the garden, and this is one of them. One of them is a raspberry patch. Uh, basically, uh, at the end of the year with that type of raspberry, which I highly recommend. It's it's really an easy um, uh, fall raspberries are an easy crop to manage. Uh, I just cut those, all those canes out, either with a clipper or, or a knife, or whatever. Um, and then the raspberries, basically, they just come up right through the, the leaves. They're, they're not so matted that um, that they um, they inhibit the, the, the growth of the rasp raspberries. Now, if you had only oak leaves, you might have to shred them before you put them on. Um, 
because they can mat and I don't have a lot of oak leaves here. So I've never, I don't have experience with that, but it's possible they could mat and inhibit some of the raspberry growth. But these canes, these new canes, this is probably April, maybe early May. They're pretty strong. So I think they'll push right up. Okay, so uh, come spring, what's going on? Um, generally, when I'm preparing a bed, again, that's one of my beds, I'm standing across from it. Um, I push the leaves aside, and I know there's been some decomposition happening over the over the um, winter time in spring, and and then I, I scrape an inch or two from my pathway. There's always a little bit of erosion over the summertime, so it doesn't hurt to get some of those nutrients that are in that top layer of my a top inch or so of my pathways back up on the on the soil in the in the bed and uh, you know, make it usable again. Uh, now, sometimes I will do the opposite. Instead of scraping them away, pushing the leaves away and scraping underneath them, I will actually chop them right into the bed. And I'll only do this in a crop that I know I'm not gonna plant for a while because it'll take some time for those uh, leaves to break down. I will often do it with cuc cucurbits. Uh, I often don't plant cucurbits until early June. And uh, I, I find that at least it's my theory that cucurbits, what I mean, the cucurbits, the, 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 the uh, melons, cucumbers, um, squashes, um, they seem to grow really well in a compost pile. If you've ever noticed that, we probably all had uh, have had compost piles that, uh, you know, the um, squashes sprout, the cucumbers sprout, whatever, from last year's seed. So I, I think that they're not as um, fussy about having things as broken down in the soil as some other crops might be. Uh, yeah, basically, I just will chop that into the soil. Um, okay, some other uses of mulch, of course, to, to, to control weeds, but but uh, they're continually breaking down. And um, straw is a is a real good one. Um, uh, I highly suggest straw over hay because hay will bring in a it'll bring in seeds, wheat seeds. Um, straw often has the seed of the the previous grain crop. Uh, for those of you, I should back up a minute. Some some don't know the difference between hay and straw. Basically, think of hay as a grass. Uh, straw is the stem of the grain. So sometimes there will be some grain, uh, you know, grain left over in the straw, but it's pretty easy to to pick out. It's, there, um, it's different than you know infesting your your uh, garden with with hay, which can have a lot of different seeds. And where I specifically use hay a lot, uh, or straw a lot. I'm sorry is in my potatoes. Um, not only is it mulch the soil, not only is it breaking down to add nutrients to the soil, um, but it's also protecting some of the, the, the potatoes that are closer to the sur surface from greening. Um, okay, so cover crops. Um, I'm gonna spend quite a bit of time on cover crops. I'll just give you a little bit of an overview. Uh, and then I'll, I'll get into um, planting and then managing and then um, how to incorporate them into the soil, because that's that's a challenge. OK, um, so this this is actually just a mix of um, it's a fall photo of a mix of oats, uh, peas and um, uh, flax. Um, and <clears throat> this is a, uh, a handout that I sent in and I think it should be available. Um, Heather or Bethany, do you know if you get out if this is available yet? Oops. Um, I did download it, so I'm going to see if I can upload it to the chat. Okay. Um, so basically, this is a um, kind of a description of uh, cover crops. Uh, one of the, some of the more uh, common ones, and <clears throat> one of the issues about cover crops is uh, most of us don't have ac local access to a lot of these seeds, uh, but they. More and more, they're becoming available through the, the normal uh, seed catalogs like uh, Johnny's and Fedco and High Mowing. And so um, I'm not going to go through this crop by crop, but if you look at the bottom here, there's a, there's a um, kind of a key. So if I go back up into, um, uh, let's go to oats, third one down, another grass used plant. Uh, whoops, sorry. Um, I'm sorry, let's go to field piece. At the end of the field piece, it says Johnny's and PV. PV is, uh, sorry, down the bottom, PV means Peaceful Valley. That's another catalog that I use for either uh, seeds or other, other items. 
Uh, they sell it by the pound. HM is high mowing and Fedco sell it by five pounds. So if you have a large place, you might be able to use a five pound bag. If you just have a you know small place, um, uh, you know a pound would be fine. So basically it gives you some ideas what they are and where to get them. Now, um, as opposed to garden seed, which you probably want to get, you know, order every year. Uh, usually, if you, unless you have a large, uh, larger garden, uh, you probably can't use a whole five pound or a whole, even a you know two pound or one pound bag in one year. So you just need to find a good way to store them. I store them in the basement where it's fairly cool, and put them in an airtight container. Um, I think these coffee coffee tins work a little better than the, than the jar because the jar does uh, allows them a little bit of light, even though it's dark in my basement. Um, I think it might be, might be helpful to protect them from light. So, so when you order them, uh, some of these seeds will last for years. Um, the ones that don't last as well are the grains. Some of those are grains, uh, rye, wheat, oats, um, barley. Um, those are grains that good cover crops. Um, but they will get weevils in them. So uh, I usually am not able to use up my whole supply in one year. Um, but uh, uh, I find a good way to store them and they, they'll last for, you know, I, some of them are some of them are five years old and they still they still do well. Uh, okay, I'm gonna go th just go through a real quick overview of cover crops. This is rye. Uh, it's it's a crop of mostly winter rye, and this is November. This is around, if I'm not mistaken, around Thanksgiving. Um, this is a field of, or a bed of hairy vetch. You can see those that plant with the little uh, opposite leaves. There is the vetch, and the uh, grain, I believe, is is um, wheat. Um, uh, again, a field, uh, a, a bed of mostly vetch, um, but I planted that before I, I took the crop out. So this is um, early November, uh, a good stand of vetch that's going to add a lot of nutrients to the soil next year. Um, this is uh, two types of clover in the back. The, the, the taller clover is red clover. Um, it's it's uh, specifically it's medium red clover. I say medium red clover. I'm specific about that because there are red clovers that are a lot more expensive. Medium red clover is, is fine for a cover crop. And the front is uh, white clover. It's it's a smaller crop. The, the red clover has a tap root uh, and the white clover, it has more spreading roots. So um, I use them, I'll, I'll show you how I establish them in a bit. And um, I, I use them for different things. I'll say planting techniques. The most simple thing is most of these things you can just, uh, you know, put in your hand and sprinkle on the ground. It's not that hard. Um, but once you get them on the ground, there's two things you can do. Uh, you can lightly rake them. Now, most of these cover crops, particularly the grains, are meant to fall off the plant, sit on the top of the ground, and germinate the next year. They're not really meant to be buried. So if you rake them, rake them very lightly. Um <clears throat> And, but actually, I don't. I usually do not rake. What I would do instead is basically take the the other side of my rake, and tamp the soil down. Now I, I go, you know, like every four or six inches, I, I tamp, tamp, tamp. And what that does is it gives the seed a a good solid contact with the soil, and it some some of it it actually you know pushes a little bit into the soil, but it doesn't really bury. So what, when you get a good contact with the soil, as long as the moisture is okay, which it usually is in the, in the fall and in the spring, you might have to water in the spring because we do have dry springs once in a while. But you can see this seed is sitting on the top of the soil and it's all sprouting. That happens to be a, uh, a spring uh, cover crop of um, field peas. And I believe that was oats. Um, but th these were not buried. These were tamped with the back of my hoe. Uh, I'm sorry, the back of my rake. I guess you could use a hoe also. Uh, if you have something that can roll the, um, the bed, that would work also. Okay, now sometimes it's in the, in the middle of the summer and you wanna get a cover crop in for one reason or another. Um, I use, extensively use floating row covers um, for that particular reason, for purpose. Now this is a bed of um, buckwheat to be put in. Um, and, um, uh, 
So basically uh, what I'm doing there is holding the moisture in. I planted, tamped it, and then put this over to hold the moisture in. Uh, and, I, and I think that um, if, if you get a dry period without cover, you know, sometimes the surface where the seed is can dry out, you know, in a day or, or two. Uh, I find that putting the floating row cover over can extend that, that moisture for another couple of days. Not saying that if we get an extended dry period, you don't have to water, but um, it, it really helps. The other thing is just putting a light level, light layer of straw on. It shades the soil, but it allows enough light to come through and uh, space for the, the little, uh, I think that's a, a clover and probably some weeds coming up there. Um, and, and you see, this is another one that was, was partially covered uh, with, um, with straw. And I, I think that was a uh, uh, summer planting, late summer planting. I think Vicki, it's Maria Gumal. Okay. How are you today? Okay. So um, let's say it is this time of year. Let's say it's March, maybe. And you say, I didn't get a cover crop planted on some particular place, but I wanted to get something in there. Um, <clears throat> There are certain crops such as clover that you can plant really early, but you really can't plant it when the ground, you know, you, it, it, you can't do, the, do it the same when the ground's frozen. Now, if you have bare ground, whether it be in your garden or elsewhere, um, you will get what's called frost heaving. Frost heaving is when the, uh, you get cold nights where the moisture in the soil causes it to expand. And then you get warm days where it contracts again but it ends up with these cracks. So you can do what's called frost seeding with certain crops, uh, clover I've tried it with. Uh, and so this particular field, uh, bed, I planted in, um, I think it was late February with clover. So I can't remember if I had already planted it here, but this is the, this is the same area uh, in probably mid-March maybe a little bit earlier. And you can see those little plants coming out of the out of the cracks. That's clover. Basically what happens is those seeds fall down into the cracks where the moisture is retained uh, and uh, it retained longer than it is on the surface. Although you do see some seeds coming up on the surface also. And uh, because the cracks don't really fill in. The, the sunlight will, you know, will continue to go down there. So when it is warm enough for them to germinate, they'll pop up in these in these cracks, and then you can get that you know your your, your cover crop established uh, in the wintertime, basically for for a spring or for the you know for the whole next year. Ah, okay. Another way I establish uh, clover is I have basically you saw my garden; it's set up in beds. The beds are about thirty foot feet long. Now I know not everybody's got the same situation, but hopefully. If you've got enough space to grow cucurbits, and I say if you've got enough space because they do take up a lot of room. Uh, uh, I have been fairly successful most years of being able to get the crop established. And there's a certain time when the, the cucurbit crop, this particular one is, I believe it's butternut squash, gets to be too big. So you can't get in with a hoe anymore to weed. At that point, I take white clover seed and I'll spray I spread it on the whole um, the whole bed, and one one rain will germinate the seed, but it'll die if it if you don't get any more moisture. So if you get a good rain, or if you get it, ideally is if you get a one of those weeks in you know June or July, late June or July or something, that you you, know, you get a rain and then it's cloudy for a few days, you might get another rainstorm. That'll really get this crop going, but. One rain will germinate it, but then after that, you have to keep it wet for a while. So if you don't have overhead irrigation, um, if you happen to have drip irrigation, you might have to get in there with a hose and spray it down. Now, the other thing I do uh, to, to establish my clover is um, in the beds next to my to my cucurbits, uh, I plant my early things like uh, early lettuces and, and other, other greens. And as they come out, I plant red clover. Now I plant red clover because it's a little more aggressive. I get a little more biomass, um, more nitrogen fixation, but I'm not worried about it competing in the same row with the, um, 
with the cucurbit crop. I haven't found the, the, the competing to really affect the, um, uh, the growth of the crop. Um, but that will give a another clover bed right next to the cucurbits. Cucurbits will, will grow. The, you know, they, they keep growing, particularly the bigger ones like, like pumpkins and, and winter squashes. So that gives them another bed where they can actually grow into that, that clover. And one, one advantage too, sometimes the clover gets well enough established that the, the, the squashes will be sitting on the clover rather than on the ground. And I think it's, it protects them a little bit from, from rotting. Uh, so basically this is a, this is one of those early crops of lettuce that as I take it out, uh, I'm putting in clover, um, you know, this uh, lettuce, uh, cilantro, some of the early crops and trying to get some uh, clover established. Now I found, um, uh, yeah, again, uh, this is a crop, <laughs> this is tomatoes. It's probably tomatoes in early September. You see some dead leaves, uh, but there's still tomatoes in the background. They're still producing from the top. Uh, I'm coming in here with a fall crop of, uh, I think it was wheat and um, uh, hairy vetch. Um, it's hard to see the hairy vetch there, but there's, there's, there's some in there. Okay, so um, Heather, Bethany, do we have any questions? Any questions coming up? Um, there's nothing in the chat yet, but um, just a reminder, folks, if you have questions, feel free to just drop them in the chat. Yeah, and if we finish, <laughs> I think we're going, I think we're doing pretty well for time. Uh, you know, we can unmute ourselves mm -hmm. too and, and, and mm -hmm. get into discussions. I'm, I'm happy with, to do that. Okay, so now we, we've planted the cover crop. Now, how do we manage it? Um, um, so this is one of the handouts that is, uh, one of the two handouts that's in the chat. Uh, and it may be available on the conference website. I, I'm not sure. Uh, this actually should be a circle because it starts in August and ends in June and July. But <clears throat> I'm, I'm not going to go through each line, but I'll tell you how to read it. So let's uh, start the second one down, oats. Um, okay, that's the crop. So the months that I have, it says plant, everything in that box, which is August, September, October, November, uh, is when you can plant that. You know, the earlier, if too early in August, sometimes the soil is still dry. And so I've had more problems with germination, uh, more, more issues with trying to keep the soil moist. So September, October, probably ideal. Uh, September particularly, but I've planted as late as November and, and, and gotten something. Um, but you can use, you can plant it again. Uh, it, it will winter kill. I'll get into that later. But you can plant it again in March and April, and it makes a really quick. It goes really quick in the spring. So it's another one of those examples that if you forgot to plant um, your, or you didn't get around to planting your cover crop in the fall because you had a crop there, or you just didn't, didn't get around to it, it was too wet. Uh, you can plant it again in March and April. It gives you a, a lot of a fairly good amount of mass, and uh, so the top line is, is oats, or or you can plant it with um, uh, field peas, um, and that's generally done in the spring, uh, in in March, uh, in, and could be into April too. Um, but those are crops that you would probably you'd want to till. In, in May, maybe even to June. I'm in central Jersey. So when I say May for me, it, it, it might be later for you guys. Okay, so I'm going to go back to show you uh, some of the results. Uh, this is that um, crop of uh, wheat and hairy vetch. Again, hairy vetch is those, those little leaves there. Uh, the wheat is the grass-like looking thing. This is that same tomato crop in early November. It's pretty, they're pretty well dead. Uh, maybe completely dead. I just haven't removed them yet, but the cover crop is really well established. Uh, I think we saw that already. That Again, that's November. Um, <clears throat> this is a, uh, excuse me, let me see. This is a crop of um, hairy vetch and wheat. Um, it may have been that same bed. I think it, I think it was a different year, um, but this is in the springtime. So this is, I believe this was mid-April. So you can see the biomass. I mean, think about um, your own compost, uh, how much you put in there, how much you get out. You know, if you put in, you know, lettuce for, for your whole, the whole year, you would probably wouldn't get as much biomass as you have here. And the vetch is a, um, 
uh, a, a nitrogen fixing legume too. So uh, you know you, you get not only the all the nutrients from the plant, but the the added nitrogen. Uh, the clover that's probably white clover on the right. Um, again, that's fixing nitrogen too. Um, so this is one of those earlier planted uh, fields of oats. Uh, and this is um, mid-November, uh, quite a bit of growth. Now this will winter kill. So in other words, it will not grow through the winter time as opposed to some of the other grains like rye, wheat, and, uh, and barley. Um, and uh, so this, is a, this would be a good uh, candidate for planting early crops, you know, lettuce or, or whatever you like to get in the garden early. Um, okay, now we're, now we're back in the spring again. Uh, and this is a, um, a, a fall planted crop of wheat and, uh, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, no, it's a spring planted crop of peas and oats. So you see the grass, that's the oats, and you can see something you recognize as peas in there too. A different angle with a little bit different, uh, you, you can distinguish the peas a little bit better. So one, uh, there's a side, side advantage of this as a cover crop and that these little pea shoots are all edible. So in April or maybe early May, uh, particularly for some of you in the colder climates, um, you can harvest these things. You know, we, we can fill up bowls of them if we have a, a, a fair amount grown. And that's, you know, we just eat them raw or, or cook them as a, as a green. And it's one of your, the first things we eat from the garden. And they're really great. Um, again, this is uh, going back to the clovers now. So what it's going to look like in uh, probably in May, uh, you know, maybe mid-May for us is late May for you guys, uh, many of you guys. But there's a lot of a lot of biomass there. Um, this happened to have been an area where I had that um, that scheme of planting a white clover underneath the the curbit, and this is the this, I believe, is the, the red clover that was next to it. The one on the left was where the white clover was, and that's already been prepared for, for planting. Um, and a, again, an example of the um, clover bed that I've established next to the cucurbits, that's melons, and they're starting to grow oh, into, into the clover. And, uh, you know, they'll, they'll, they'll stay there. Now, white clover is also a, uh, can be walked on. I, I told you, it doesn't have tap roots, it has spreading roots. Um, and it's, you know, it's what people will plant in their lawns. So you can plant it in any kind of permanent permanent pathway you have. This happens to be the, the um, pathway that goes the opposite direction of my, my beds, parallels my blueberry plants. And uh, it's a fairly nice uh, crop of, of clover that I've had in there for years. I've only planted it once. now. When you have a, a permanent, we want to be a permanent cover crop like this, quite often the weeds will, will work their way in. So I do have some grasses in there that I have to control. But, um, you know, it, it, it's formed a nice uh, walking bed. Crimson clover is another, sorry, another um, one of those uh, plants. Beautiful plant. <laughs> you know, if you want a cover crop that really makes it adds color to your garden. But, uh, this crimson clover, it's an annual. It does not overwinter well, but it could be something, uh, for instance, remember when we did the frost seeding, uh, that frost seeding may have been for a bed that I just wanted to have a, a, a uh, clover crop in there for maybe uh, you know half a year and plant the fall crop. This would be a good choice, the, the crimson clover. Um, <clears throat> now, uh, You've seen some of my beds that have been established with really thick clover. Now, legumes will fix more nitrogen if there is a non-leguminous crop mixed in that will use that nitrogen. So it's best, you know, that's why hairy vetch is, you try to plant hairy vetch with a grain crop, for instance. Um, this clover, I've started to, to, to do some experimenting. I've been doing it for a while. Uh, with planting perennial rye. Perennial rye is, it's just a, a uh, lawn, lawn grass. Now, in, in typically uh, in garden supply stores, uh, it's hard to get just uh, perennial rye. They're all 
grasses are all mixed. And some of the, some of the, um, you know, it's the perennial rye and there'll be Kentucky bluegrass and fescue and whatnot. Uh, so, but some of the, some of the garden supply stores will have, um, you know, you can make, make your own mix. So if, if you have the opportunity to get some perennial rye, um, here's how you can use it. Uh, basically, I just planted at the same time as the clover and you can see the grasses in there. So, uh, you know, I, I haven't measured this with a soil test, but I've, I've been told um, uh, that, um, yeah, it, it will just fix more nitrogen if you put that that uh, that grass in. Now, I, I mentioned that sometimes uh, when I am um, growing some of these, uh, planting some of these cover crops in the summertime, such as the ones that follow my early um, um, early uh, cover uh, crops like like lettuces. Uh, it's a little dry and I have a little bit of trouble establishing them. So what I've started to do, which it seems to be working pretty well, is planting a little bit of buckwheat with the clover. Um, buckwheat is a very quick growing crop and I'll get into that, the specifics of it shortly, but it, 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 it grows quick enough that it shades the soil. And I, I seem to be getting better germination with the clovers. Ah, okay. Oh, Al, you do have a handful of questions. And okay. Matt, do you want to take those now or? Uh, yeah, I can. I can take them now. Um, you know, let, let me go. Let me finish up with this section because maybe someone okay. will get answered, and then uh, then let's go to the questions. Okay, so we'll go back to that perennial rye. Sometimes when you plant two cover crops together, one of them does well and one of them doesn't. And this particular year. The perennial rye did well, and and the clover did not. So I ended up with a a, a, a patch of solid perennial rye. So it's a grass; it'll go to seed. So you probably want to keep cutting it after seed. But what what I do when in this particular situation, and as I as I cut it, you know, every month or so, and then I either take that to the compost pile or I use it for mulch in another bit. And it's established itself in some of my rows. You can see that garlic plant right in the middle, just to the left of that, that's a, that's a pathway. So I don't try to get rid of that. I just keep cutting it and uh, you know using it for mulch or, or adding to the compost pile. Um, so one of the final, I think it's one of the, the, the later cover crops. This is, uh, it, it's the last one that is on that handout. It is uh, field radishes or um, cover crop radishes. This It's basically a, a large daikon. This is what it looks like when it's mature. It's a good cover crop uh, if you have uh, hard soils because there's usually as much of the plant under the ground as there is on top of the ground and they don't overwinter. So basically, if you can plant them in, in summertime by the fall, this, this was taken this December, uh, they get to be this big. And it'll just die, but the the part that's in the ground will basically uh, create a, a, a hole. Uh, it's not like a a hole you would fall in, but uh, it's really softening the soil in that in that one particular spot. Um, so, okay. So again, um, this is a a uh, bed that I'm not ready to plant anything in yet, and a crop in yet. So uh, that's a good time for buckwheat. Buckwheat is a warm weather crop. And again, this is what I use to help germinate it. This is at 12 days. So it's, it's up pretty quickly. I didn't get a, I didn't get a real solid stand with, with this planting, uh, which can happen in the summertime. But 12 days, I think this was 19 days. So again, it's coming in very quickly. Um, this was 26 days. And this is 32 days. So buckwheat, the best time to take the crop off or chop it in, incorporate it in the soil, is when you get 10% bloom. So how do you know when there's 10% bloom? Well, you got to wait till it's 100% and say you should have done it eight days ago, something like that. Um, but if you see flowers like this, you know, they're, they're sparse, but they're coming in. That's about 10% bloom. Now, if you let it go much beyond that, uh, the canopy starts to open up. There's a, there's a, a side benefit of buckwheat. And that the canopy can grow so thick that it, it shades out and actually kills the weeds below it. So if you let it go too much longer than that, the canopy starts to open up. Again, this is not a real, this is not the best stand. I'll, I'll show you some better stands of buckwheat in, in, in a bit. But this is where I'm ready to either chop this in or I could cut it off and take it to the compost pile 
And sometimes I get two buckwheat crops in the same year. Now, this is uh, this is probably what it looks like. This is not the same crop. This is a better stand, not the same bed. Um, this is at 40 days. It's It's gone too long. Um, but you can see how solid it can get. If you were a little weed down there, you wouldn't get any sunlight and you would either not grow or, or die. Um, so this is, this is a buckwheat crop that all I did was, um, I actually it was probably this one. Um, I let it go a little bit, a little bit longer because some of that, those flowers matured into seed. And then I just cut it with a side and let the, the stalks lay and the seed regerminated itself. So I got a second crop out of this. At 35 to 40 days, sometimes in the summertime, you have a bed that's open, you're gonna put something in in the fall or you're just saving it up for a fall cover crop. You can get two crops of buckwheat in and it, it can really add a lot of biomass. Okay, um, Bethany, let's take some questions now. And uh, if if there's something that we're gonna get to later, I'll just say, we'll, we'll, we'll see. Okay, sounds good. So Jenny asks, how do you prevent weevils from getting into your stored cover crop grains? Okay, good, good question. Um, so I have, uh, you know, I don't have any, I've never bought a, 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 an amount more than a bit more than five pounds. Um, and generally, I won't have, you know, more than two or three pounds left over after a, a season. So I try to remember with my grains, once a year, I put them in the freezer. Now, remember, um, that doesn't, that doesn't, uh, as far as I know, that doesn't affect their germination because in the, in the natural state, they would have fallen off in the um, in the fall and laying on the ground all winter long where they would have been frozen anyway. So um, yeah, again, I, I keep them, I try to keep them in, in an airtight container, but I think some of the weevils are actually in there already. So um, free, I freeze them at least once a year. Great, thanks. Um, Erica would like to know if you can speak to the best way to use chicken droppings. They have some backyard layers. Well, um, I, if I had chicken layers, I would put it in my compost. Uh, I mean, if I had ch chicken drops, I would put them in my compost because it actually, it, it, it's high in nitrogen. It actually speeds the composting up. Now, um, without that, I would just, I, I would you know, you can put it on your soil. Now, what happens when you put it on, on the top of your soil is that some of the um, nitrogen is volatile. So a lot of the, the nitrogen can get lost. So if you do use it as just a, a you know, spreading, spreading as, you, as you would compost, um, I would try to get it dug in as, as quickly as possible. Um, I, I, I'm not sure I'm completely answering your question, Jennifer. Is it Jennifer? Sorry, it was Erica. Erica, yeah. Erica, um, is, that, is that answering your question? You can take yourself off mute. She says that it's great. Thanks. Okay. I'm, I'm thinking that I had something else in mind too. Um, okay. Well, well, we'll leave it at the other. <laughs> um, Lisa would like to know, in what conditions is it better to plant white versus red clover? Okay. Um, I think in most cases, I, I, would, I would go with red because you get more biomass and it's actually an easier crop to incorporate, and I'll, I'll show that in a few minutes, uh, because it doesn't have those extensive uh, surface roots. Um, but the reason I plant white is because it, that's what goes right under my cucurbits. In other words, it's, it's in the same bed as I planted my cucurbits. And I don't know this for a fact, but I just don't think it's, it's as, as competitive right away uh, as the, the red clover would be. So I don't think it's, it's um, uh, what do you call it, extracting nutrients from the soil that would be in competition with the cucurbits. The, well, the, one of the reasons for that is it doesn't have the, the long tap root. So it's, it's, its roots are mostly near the surface. So, um, and then the other situation I would use in is, is permanent, um, permanent walkways that I wanted to, to walk on, red clover. Uh, red clover uh, generally has a lifespan of, um, maybe one full season and then you know maybe part of another but it pretty much peters out after after year two or into year two so a long range uh clover stand should be white thanks mm -hmm. uh, marceline would like to know do you have to rotate cover crops and can you grow clover in the same area every year 
Yeah, I, I again, some of my clovers are, are, are permanent in permanent areas, um, but I, I rotate cover crops only because I rotate my crops. <laughs> so each year I get, you know, different, uh, when the cucurbits are there, that's where the clover goes. When the tomatoes um, are, are, you know, other early crops are grown, that's where my my vetch and um, uh, wheat or rye or whatever grows. Um, and, uh, you know, buckwheat, I just, uh, I see a bed that's going to be open for a while. I just put buckwheat in. So it's really, um, I don't know that there's any harm in growing the same cover crop uh, in, in the same place several years in a row. But if you rotate your crops, you just automatically rotate your, your cover crops. Great. Thanks. Carrie would like to know if we have to till them in. Yeah, I'll get it to the tillage right now, Carrie. <laughs> Um, just a second. Um, there's another question. Do you have any opinions on Korean natural farming methods, specifically the fungal inoculates and lactic bacteria recipes? Well, I don't have a lot of, uh, I, I know what you mean. I don't have a lot of experience in those, but, um, the fungal inoculants, that's what I'm trying to do with that, that, uh, round, uh, I call it Johnson Sioux digester. Uh, I'm, I'm trying to get some fungal, you know, more fungus into my garden beds. Um, you know, I, I, that was probably made about 40 years ago and I'm almost to the bottom of it now. So I'm going to have to replenish and probably go without for a year. And I, I actually can't tell, I can't see my, um, mycorrhizae growing in the bottom. I thought it would probably look like, um, when you, if you're out in the woods and you've, you know, you accidentally kick a, a, a rotten log or something like that. You can actually see what what is probably some mycorrhizal, large mycorrhizal um, under the under the log. I thought I would see that. I don't. So I'm actually not positive how how well it's working, but I don't think it's doing any harm. Um, and um, uh, so I guess that's uh, you know. Otherwise, some of the the, the Korean natural farm. I'm, I'm really not. Um, I'm, I'm not that familiar with, so I'm not sure I can quite answer the question. Maybe I did as much as I can, but if we have some time, we can hear from, from other people too at the end. And then what is the relative timing of planting the white clover and the cucurbits? Which one first, et cetera? Yeah. Um, so I will uh, cultivate, and you know, everything I do with a hand, so that, that means with a, with a shuffle hoe. Uh, my curb bed to, to control the weeds until they start to, to vine up so that I can't really get in there with my hoe anymore. And that is when I go ahead and plant the, the, uh, the, the clover uh, for two reasons. One is I can't get in there and, um, and cultivate, but the other is that means that the leaves are starting to cover the soil. So when I, when I um, overseed or underseed, whatever you call it with the uh, white clover, it's getting a little bit of shade from the from the leaf, so it, it, um, it it's a little bit better for germinating. Now, some of those crops like uh, uh, butternut squash, um, the leaves are so big that sometimes uh, there are dry spots on the soil because the the water hits the leaf and it runs down in one place, and the under, right underneath that leaf is dry. So sometimes they get patches where I didn't get very good germination. But um, I think I, I think I answered the question. <laughs> All right, and one last question. Um, is there a chart that shows what cover crops are best before seasonal crops? I'm sorry, for, for four seasonal crops? Before seasonal oh. crops. Um, well, I don't, I don't have it, but I basically just think about what can I get in? In other words, uh, I, uh, so around us, we're probably a, a week or two ahead of, of most in New York State. Um, but I know that I can get an early crop of um, oats and peas in in the spring and get some pretty good growth out of it um, before I plant you know, tomatoes or you know particularly cucurbits, which are actually a couple of weeks later. Um, so yeah, I think you know use that chart of when to plant what and and I think probably answer it for yourself. Great, thank you, Al. 
All right. So I want to get into uh, tillage, soil incorporation, and bed preparation. And I, I'm going to do that in two, two different ways. I think I'll have time for both. Um, one is the, 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 the normal way of, of uh, tilling things in, again, all by hand. Uh, if you have a if you have lawnmowers and and rototillers, then you can probably uh, tune out with some of this. But I, I'm also going to get into some uh, no tillage things that I've tried on the garden scale um, at the end. So um, uh, I think we'll have time for that. Uh, and some of my no till experiments have been successful, and some have been less than successful. So I'll get into both. Okay. So this is going back to that buckwheat crop that you looked at. This is the one that was really thick. And I cut it. I, I, I don't use a lawnmower. I, I think it would have been too thick to use a lawnmower. I actually don't use a lawnmower in my garden for two reasons. One is I, I, I want to stick by my principle of not using any motorized uh, equipment in the garden. Everything's by hand. Um, and the other is I feel if I bring my lawnmower in there, I've got weeds in my grass, my lawn that I'm going to bring into the garden. So I want to try to keep it clean. So I have a scythe. I cut this with a scythe. And this was so thick that I believe I, I brought this to the compost pile. Um, again, this was a, um, a, a really heavy crop of um, clover. Uh, and I cut it off and I brought it to the compost pile. I just cut it with a scythe. Uh, I don't have anything against using a lawnmower. As a matter of fact, a lawnmower would cut this stuff up into um, smaller, you know, really smaller pieces probably. And then you wouldn't have to take it to the compost pile. It would probably put, uh, leave more of it there. But I figure take it to the compost pile or just bring a little bit more compost back when it's time to plant. Uh, so basically, you know, I just put them in the compost pile. I mix them up and it's uh, it's nitrogen. Uh, these crops are high in nitrogen. So sometimes I can get some, some heat built up in the compost pile just by bringing those um, cover crops here. Other things you can do with it, um, mulch, um, you know, early crop of, uh, of um, onions, um, some of that um, clover I just used as mulch to keep some moisture in the soil around the onions. Um, okay, so uh, I do all my, most of my tilling uh, with just a hoe, just, just a regular garden hoe, and, and basically just chop them. My, my bed's a 30 foot long, and Typically, it's it's different from cover crop to cover crop, but typically takes me about a half an hour to do the, the, the initial tillage, um, which means I've got a cover crop. There's two options with a cover crop. One is to just chop the whole thing in, and the other is to cut the tops off and bring that to the compost pile. A little bit easier to work that way. Uh, I'm not looking for a real clean tillage the first time through. I'm just trying to look to, to killing most of the cover crop. Um, so some of these, uh, this is was a uh, probably a grass, a, a vetch or, or uh, wheat. It's uh, they're, they're in clumps, so sometimes the clumps are a little bit hard to handle. Uh, you, you have to chop them up a little bit with a hoe. So there's quite a bit of work the first time through the bed, and sometimes you end up with this with with the clumps, and then I would maybe go over those clumps real quickly to try to break off most of the dirt from the from the roots so they actually die. So um, now there's, how do you make the decision of when to cut it uh, and remove it to the compost pile or to chop it in? So this is a uh, spring, or probably a fall, a fall planted crop of wheat and, and vetch. I keep mentioning wheat. I, I prefer wheat as a winter cover crop over rye. Rye is a faster growing <clears throat> cover, um, but it can get out of, it can get away from you in the spring. It gets to be too big. So wheat's a little slower growing, uh, a little more in tune with the, 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 the growth of the vetch. And so I, I tend to use wheat. This is about a foot high, maybe a little bit bigger. At this point, I would just chop the whole thing in. Uh, when it gets to be a couple feet like this, this is, it happens to be more, more of a vetch crop than a heavy, heavy vetch crop with a little bit of, of wheat. Um, that's too thick to go through with my hoe. So definitely take the top off, bring it to the compost pile, just Bring in, bring back more compost when you plant. Um, so this was that um, bed of I think it was red clover actually uh, that we saw a couple times in the past. This, this is when I had gone through it. This particular bed I had removed the tops. I went through it with my hoe uh, the first time. This is what it looks like. There's still a lot of green in there. Most of that'll die within a week because it's still you know still got a little bit of. Um, uh, oh, it hasn't died yet, basically. 
Um, but there's a lot of green in it. This is not ready to plant. So this would be the second time I had gone through. This is a week after the second time. There's still a little bit of green in there. There's still some, some clover that's attached to roots, which are getting some moisture from the soil. So I haven't killed everything yet, but starting to see quite a bit more breakdown. And um, this is basically a crop of um, vetch and, and uh, wheat that I did not take the tops off uh, and I just chopped it. It was probably that one that was about a foot high. Um, and uh, this is basically what it looked like. Again, this took about a half an hour to do most of these uh, these 30 foot long beds. Now, um, when we go back here, the second time, I had already done a second hoeing there. Second hoeing only takes about 10 minutes. Once you've got the initial breakup of the clumps, it only takes about 10 minutes. Now, you know, I'm, I'm fairly fit. Um, and I like the exercise. Uh, that's why I garden. <laughs> One of the reasons I garden. Um, so, uh, you know, it, heck, if you have a rototiller, I'm not real high on rototillers because I can be a decent soil. But if you have one and you want to use it, that's fine. Um, so, again, first first uh, hoeing of the uh, the other cover crop. Now, um, this is one. This is that perennial uh, perennial rye. Happened to have planted it one year that the... the um, Clover didn't really take that yet for some reason. I don't know why, but uh, I get almost a, a full stand of, of perennial rye. This is a lot harder to deal with. If you think of, um, if you've ever tried to dig up your lawn for something, for planting something, or if you even if you've tried to take a rototiller through your lawn, uh, it's difficult. The, those lawn grasses have really fibrous roots that are great for the soil, um, but they're hard to control. So, at this stage, I don't want to get any let it get any bigger this because it'll start to seed up and, and I may not want perennial rye there next year. So this I definitely want to cut it back. Um and um once you even when you cut it back, those those fibrous roots, they're just they're hard to, to deal with. And um, so I don't remember if this is the uh, after the first or the second time. I think it was after the first time I I had taken the crop off and, and tried to chop up the roots, but very difficult to do. So eventually, um, this was after the third time going through, I still had a lot of these root balls. And ideally, if, if I'd been able to leave these in a the soil, which I think I know how to do now, more, uh, more of a no-till system, um, they would be great for just softening up the soil. But I, I had to get them out to get ready for the crop. So eventually, I ended up with these little little balls of roots. And I just basically raked them to the side of the bed, kind of on the edge of the bed and the pathway, and they became a, a mulch. Um, and they broke down actually fairly quickly because they're so fibrous and, and, and small. So, um, you know, I was able to get them out and plant without much problem. So this is, um, I can't remember which bed it was, but it was one of those beds we looked at earlier. This is after the fourth time through. I, I often go through four times, and again, this this the after the first time, the second, third, and fourth time through is it's less than ten minutes uh, because the soil becomes so much more fine. And basically, I'm just looking for any more clumps that I need to break up. Uh, but this uh, is ready to be shaped and 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 planted. You can see there's some what I call trash in there. Basically, there's still remainders of cover crops. And when I plant, they usually don't get in the way much. If they do, I just rake them to the side with my hoe, um, my, my rake. Al, can you share how yeah. wide your beds are? Yeah, they're, um, uh, it's six foot from, from one, the middle of one pathway to the other pathway. Ideally, I like my beds four foot wide, but they don't quite make it. So they're probably about three, three to three and a half foot wide. Good question. Okay. So this is going back to what we looked at before. I'm, I'm now shaping my beds. Um, and before I plant, I generally like to loosen the soil if I can. Um, I have a really heavy duty uh, digging fork, a Smith & Hawken. I don't think Smith & Hawken is still in business anymore. Uh, but uh, it's Bulldog Tool Company from, they're actually made in England. And I think they are still sold in the United States. A really heavy duty fork that I can um, easily fork. Uh, Johnny's and some of the, the uh, other seed companies uh, sell these um, uh, broad forks, I think they're called. So it's a little bit easier to, to loosen up there. I don't spend a lot of time. I, I maybe spend 10 minutes per 30 foot bed, um, you know, just, just going through with my fork, just basically slamming it into the soil, wiggling around a little bit and then move on another six or eight inches. And probably the same with, with one of these. 
Um, so once I've got that uh, that state, I basically just rake the rake the bed flat, and then I, I'm really ready to plant. Um, so um, before we pause for questions, um, Heather and Bethany, I want to take a look. Now, this was my uh, soil test I took after my first year gardening on this uh, place where we now live. And there's a couple of things. Uh, hopefully, you can see my arrows. A couple of things I want to look at here. One is the pH, 6.7. That's kind of ideal. You know, mid sixes is, is ideal for most garden crops. And whoops. And the other thing I want you to look at is the organic matter, 3.3%. I, I'm an organic inspector, so I look at, at you know I can look at dozens or hundreds of of um, uh, soil tests a year, and you know 3.3 is not bad for for a farm farm soil, um, but I want to try to get that up there. So we'll see what happens. Now this is at this is 2015, so that's after basically 10, 10 seasons. Whoops, ten seasons. And I want you to look at a couple things. Uh, the soil pH has gone up 0.4%. Um, and so that was a little bit of a concern because it's up over seven and I'd like to keep it in the sixes. Um, but here's the other thing that what I was real happy about is my organic mat had gone up to 5.7. So basically you've seen my program and you've seen what it does to the soil. Now, we live in, oh, wait a minute, one more. Um, basically, I had, this is our state lab. So this one is the private lab. This is our state lab. You can see that the pH is exactly the same uh, and the organic matter 5.7. So um, basically I did this just to show or try to prove or disprove that the um, uh, state soil labs are you know, the same as the, as the private ones. And, and I found that they are. Um, now, this is, is that field, uh, that uh, plot, that I only had raspberries, and I only, I only used leaves for fertility. There was no, comp no compost, um, nothing else. So as you see, the, the pH went up even higher, went up to 7.3, which was a concern for me. But the organic matter went up another two points. So great organic matter. Um, I took this to uh, our um, Rutgers uh, soil scientist, Joe Heckman, who happened to be on, who happened to have been on the NOFA board for many years. And I said, Joe, how do I get that uh, pH down? Uh, I thought I was adding leaves and I thought that it would make an acidic soil. I says, no, it doesn't. I said, you know, you, it may make an acidic soil temporarily, but uh, leaves will actually, will actually raise the, the, um, the, the pH. Um, and uh, but you know I'm, I'm real happy about the the, the organic matter in that, that part of it. So so basically what Joe said uh, is um, the he said the first thing I would do is take your eggshells out of your compost, and that's probably where a lot of your compost is is I'm sorry a lot of your the garden bed not not necessarily the um, uh, the raspberries were only gut leaves, but that's probably where a lot of your your excess pH was. And then stop putting your shells and bones on the on the soil. And so, in uh, I don't have a, a copy here, but in 2022, uh, I'm sorry, the end of 2021, I took another soil test, which would be after six or seven years, and my my pH is back down to 6.7. So I think that was good advice. Um, Okay, I'm gonna get into some no-till, Bethany, but we have any questions? Um, we do have one question. Um, each time you go through, uh, seems to be about a week apart. So depending on the crop, the need to prep, is the need to prep a bed about a month before planting? Yes, I, I would say yes. A very and, good, a good question. And we are at um, uh, 11.15, so I just wanted to let you know. Okay, that. do we have to 11.30 or we're supposed to get cut off? <laughs> Um, I think we can give it a couple more minutes. Okay. Um, yeah. So um, I, I'm trying to get into more, more uh, less tilling. Uh, my tilling basically is with my hoe. So it's not deep, a deep tilling. So it's not highly destructive. But I do feel like the less we till, uh, if we don't till at all, then we, we um, are not disturbing the soil. Disturbing the soil 
uh, it does mix things in, but it also speeds up decomposition of what your organic matter is in the soil. So it can help to, to maintain that organic matter. And it also, um, mycelium, if I can get mycelium established in the soil, it does feed most crops except for the brassicas. So it's it's to my advantage to get the mycelium and mycelium does not do well with tillage. It, it, once you break up that my, those strands of mycelium, it takes a long time for them to reestablish. So there's, there's definite, I mean, this whole, this whole workshops on, on, on no tills. So I'm just going to go through a few things here because some of those don't, or it's hard to figure out how to apply to a garden. Okay. So first I'm going to start, start off with the, um, uh, the perennial rye, because that was the hardest to deal with, with conventional hoeing. Uh, so I tried a few things. I tried cutting it down to the, to the ground level with my scythe. I tried cutting it down to the ground level with my, my machete. Um, and then I sharpened my, my spade and I tried cutting it down to ground level with the, with the um, spade. Um, and in most cases, I was able to get most of the top up, but because the roots are so fibrous, that basically this is what happened after her, probably after a couple of weeks or a month. Basically, they, they grew back. Now, if I had gone back here and started, uh, you know, hoeing with my hoe after I did that, um, I probably would have been able to kill it all. But I didn't because I didn't need to get right in there. But basically, it, it grew back. So I would say that was not a, a high success. Um, some of your uh, your other cover crops, like this one is is uh, is rye. It's a it's a um, a stock. It was uh, easier to just to cut this at ground level. I don't remember what I cut it with, but this is kind of what it looked like. And I I, uh, I thought I left the, the socks lay, but I, I don't see too many. It was not a heavy. It was not a thick cover crop. And then basically, I just kind of cleared that refuge around and planted, I think this was tom tomato. So that would be a place where a tomato was going to go. Um, so I've gotten a little bit better at, at handling uh, cover crops now. This is an, a, an early spring crop of, um, or I should say or early May, uh, probably mid, it would be mid-May for, for a lot of you guys, <coughs> of uh, uh, vetch and um, uh, sorry, barley. Uh, barley is just one of those grain crops that, that uh, sometimes I use. And <clears throat> what I did was I went through with my my hoe, uh, turned backwards, and I just kind of tried to crimp uh, crimp down the whole crop. It took a while, um, but uh, this is basically what it looked like. Doesn't look too much different except things are laying down. Um, and then I um, I kind of rake things more into the middle. I pulled up some soil from the from the edges, and then I covered it with plastic. Now I'm not a big uh, big fan of of um, plastic mulch. This is not actually a mulch. This is a clear plastic. You you can't use black and well you could use black in this situation. But what I'm trying to do is is um, bur basically burn the crop without without burning the soil. And I, uh, you know this was some leftover. I I got. Uh, a we had a mattress delivered at some point, you know, big piece of plastic. I saved that. That's uh, and I had we built our own house 25 years ago. I still had a half a roll of plastic that we used to cover the lumber when it was outside. So, you know, I, I tried to use scraps when possible. A neighbor gave me an old clear shower curtain. So, you know, <laughs> uh, I, I you can use a lot of re recycling here. So, um, <clears throat> uh, Brian O'Hara, who's written the uh, from Tobacco Farm, Tobacco Root Farm in Connecticut has written a book on, you know, solarizing soil as is uh, Daniel Mays from Maine. And so th those are good resources on how to do some of these things. Uh, so basically I covered this. I left it on for a couple of days. I think Brian O'Hara says in the middle of the summertime, don't leave it on for more than a day because it's so hot under there. And you can see that, that we went from here to here in just a couple of days. That's brown. Take it off. Everything had died. Now, vetch, primarily vetch here. Uh, and it's a little bit easier uh, crop to manage. But basically, I killed it. And this is where my tomatoes were going. So I basically just pulled it, um, uh, pulled the, the vetch back, dug a hole, buried my, you know, my tomato roots, and... Um, I had a ready-made mulch. Now the mulch, it looks thick there, but um, it breaks down pretty quickly. So the mulch is not so much that it completely shades the soil and prevents weeds, but it, it does hold them back. It was, it was pretty good in that respect. Um, so a couple of weeks later, I got a little bit better at this. 
this is where my cucurbits were going to go. And I had this board I already had the two holes in it because it was where my, it was used as a support for my old raspberry patch. I just put rope in there and I used it as a, what I call a crimper. Um, I think Brian Mays has some suggestions for this in his, in his book. Uh, I, I'm sorry, Daniel Mays. So basically I'm just knocking the crop over so that I can go back. This is basically what it looked like. Um, there was, um, I think that was uh, wheat or, or barley. And there's vetch in there. And there are some places where the uh, we had a pretty good establishment of clover. So basically I covered that the same way you see the other, the other um, booklet, uh, the other picture. And then when I took it off, I said, okay, this is a much thicker cover crop because it was a couple of weeks later. And uh, how am I going to plant in here? So my cucurbits, I just plant one, you know, one row. So basically I was able to go down there with uh, this, this ice chopper, I guess. And, kind of chop a hole in the middle there, pull it, pull the uh, crop back. And then I planted right in the, you know, right in the middle. And it was pretty good. Now there were, there's some issues though. Um, it did not, this method did not kill the dandelions. So the dandelions came back. And then if you look up the top of the screen, that's a buckwheat seed that was planted in a previous cover crop. So buckwheat's a warm weather crop and it actually liked the, the warm soil under, under the, um, under the plastic uh, and it germinated, but not, there was not a heavy population of weeds in here. They were not hard to control. Um, and then the other thing is that uh, this was some white clover, that, that spreading clover, that's my pathway up the top. And this is the bed that I covered in this. So it didn't completely cover, uh, kill all the clover. I had to pull a little bit up with hand, but it wasn't very hard to do. So basically, you know, all this stuff is to grow, you know, nice looking crops like this. <laughs> So, um, Bethany, uh, yeah, let's open it up, and if uh, either either to um, if anybody wants to unmute, I'll stop sharing. Sure. We only just have a couple of moments before we're going to need to use the link to prepare for the next presentation, but we could take um, a couple of questions. Um, one that is coming from the chat is: Could you use a silage tarp? for tarping purposes? Um, well, I consider a silage tarp to be one that's um, uh, a plastic that's white on one side and black on the other. And um, I, I may not have the same definition of a silage tar tarp. Um, so if you put the black side up, um, then you can, but it takes a long time to, basically you're killing there, not from heat, you're killing from uh, lack of sunlight. So it takes at least a month, I think, may maybe even longer. Um, but it's not a bad way. I have used that to establish beds, uh, you know, initially when I, when I planting something or if I put a tree in, sometimes I've put that plastic on over the summertime uh, and, um, uh, you know, it basically kills it so I can plant in, in the fall. So I, I think that um, uh, I, I actually do have some plastic, uh, some silage tarps, and I, I use the white side for, for protecting my strawberries from um, late spring frost that will kill the blossom. So I like the silage tarps. Um, if, if that's my, if we're using the same definition of silage tarps. Thanks, Al. Um, that is it for the questions that I'm seeing in the Zoom. Um, we could probably take like one more question if someone's interested in unmuting and then we will um, need to uh, get off of the, the Zoom link. So. Does anyone have one last question for Al? Or comments, if you get a comment, yeah. I have a very quick question. Um, I was just wondering if there are any um, native varieties of clover that might be useful in cover cropping or permanent pathways. I'm sorry, Cassie, can you repeat that? Any, uh, are there any native varieties oh. of clover that might be useful? Um, do, are you familiar with any native varieties of clover? That Actually, I'm not. I'm not sure what's native and what's not native, except that some of the white clover I've been able to buy is called New Zealand clover. So I have a feeling it's not. Yeah. Um, I, and, you know, and, and the other variety I, I use is Dutch white clover, which is probably not either. Um, that's, you know, I've never, I've never thought about whether or not clover was native. Is it, it you know, is it, is none of it native? Um, I have a limited understanding, but I know I 
I think I've heard that the the white the perennial white clover is not native and even maybe a little bit invasive, but I also know that it might might be it could be naturalized. I don't know. Somebody probably knows better than me. Yeah. Um, but that well, there are native varieties of clover, I think. Oh yeah, hey, I, I I didn't realize that. Uh, I know, like white clover, for instance, it'll you don't have to plant it in the lawn; it'll it'll come in by itself. Um, so it's here. Yeah, um, I think they maybe the white clover may be naturalized in the way dandelions are. I'm not yeah, sure. Probably, yeah. I don't consider that a bad thing. I, mean, I think clover is wonderful, actually. No, not necessarily either. But I I'm always curious about native varieties if I can. I, I don't know anything about the crimson clover, other than it looks really nice. <laughs> yeah, I love crimson clover. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you, Al. We really appreciate you taking your time to share a wealth of knowledge with us today. Um, and again, folks, the um, recording will be available on the on the app for anyone that wants to um, revisit the presentation. And um, we thank you for joining us. Have a great day. Thank you.